All right, hey guys, I'm going to start a little series on just some basics of computer science. And um, I thought, what not, uh, what better way to, to do that than uh, looking through a game engine lens? And, you know, making games is pretty fun, so let's try that with GDScript. And uh, C++, just real basic stuff with C++, nothing complicated in the language that we'll talk about right now. But variable scope is a concept that you got to kind of grasp pretty early on. And if you don't know about variables yet, you should probably read about that. And I will probably do a tutorial on that a little later. But in general, I'll assume that you know pretty much what a variable is and a method and that kind of thing, functions. Uh, so what is scope? In simple terms, it's places in code where you can access an identifier. An identifier is a variable name, like class, method name, object properties, members of those objects, signals, so anything you can access the name in a program. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty broad. So here's an example in GDScript. Uh, so here you can see pause is um, identified here and uh, it is declared in this function called hide or show if needed. And uh, the basics of this is that it's scoped just for that function. So when that function is called, uh, pause is available and is instantiated there and when it goes it goes away when the function is done and so it's only accessible um, within this function as I already said uh, it goes out of scope and ends and in this case it actually reclaims the space too um, for that variable but we'll talk about this a little bit outside the scope of a uh, <laughs> of scope so We'll talk about that a little later, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anytime something goes out of scope, it'll be reclaimed. But a lot of languages, modern languages, actually do that now. Um, and if there's no other references to the to the variable, to the object. Um, so you can see there's also this called a graphics here, show, and this is actually uh, I can show more code later. But this is actually declared um, in the outer section of the uh, class itself. So. That's why it's accessible there. Um, otherwise, you know, and you'd have a problem if, say, graphics was defined and declared in some other function, you wouldn't be able to access here. Okay. So, what is scope not? As I said, the scope doesn't really necessarily dictate lifetime. That means when, when it gets deleted. Um, so, being out of scope and being deleted from memory are two different things, like I said. Uh, that said, like I also alluded to is main languages will delete a variable if it isn't being used anywhere so that's called reference counting but don't confuse that with scope and being deleted it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing and you'll run into problems especially with languages like c plus plus where you uh, allocate stuff in the heap and there are no more references to it and it goes out of scope and it doesn't get deleted automatically unless you use some smart pointers and things like that anyway um so we'll talk about how programming languages manage memory in other tutorials, and so not here, it's kind of out of scope for this tutorial. Um, and it varies wildly you know, upon the language. Um, but I will say though, that GDScript manages a lot of memory automatically. So as long as there's no references to that object, a lot of times it get deleted automatically. If it's a node, and it's part of like some other um, structure, like if it's a, it's a child of some node in your scene, you have to call Q free and you know anyway that's a lot of scope for this so okay let's talk about types of scope uh, there's lexical scoping which is pretty normal the stuff you see like what I just mentioned in the previous slide where it's defined in a well-defined structure here um, and when it goes out of the structure it is no longer able to be accessed there are other types of scope that are non-hierarchical called dynamic scoping, which is really weird, um, not used very often, and usually you have to do something very specific to enable it. And uh, it's based on the code ex based on the code execution. So you can see here in this example, um, we have an example that adds all the variables. So it adds all the variables uh, to the scope as you go in the execution. So it's kind of confusing, but here let's just kind of look at this. So this is Perl, and uh, it's yeah, sorry, the syntax is kind of strange, but um, so say we want to print the, the value that B returns here. Um, and as you can see, B returns whatever is returned in A. And here, this local keyword, as I say here, uh, it actually makes sure that this is going to be 
dynamically scoped. And so the really bizarre thing is when you call A here, and you, you can actually reference this number uh, from this scope, and, and actually it prints out 10. You can try it for yourself. Uh, it's pretty easy. You can just type this out into a file, and if, as long as you have a Perl interpreter, you can run it. Um, yeah, so it, it's pretty unexpected. I don't find much use for using dynamic scope, so just just for the sake of completion here and have, showing you different types available, I'm showing here. And there, there's a few languages that actually do this kind of stuff, and I I really recommend against this, especially if you're just learning programming. It's It can be really confusing. Um, I suppose it has its place, but I, I don't really enjoy using <laughs> dynamic scope. Uh, teach their own. Uh, yeah, so here's some language where you can enable it. Uh, sorry, these are languages that do not use it typically. Uh, so these are lexical scoped. Uh, Kotlin, C++, Java, Python, GDScript, the usual stuff. So as we just saw, uh, Perl is one that can use dynamic scoping. Lisp, you know, uh, Scala, Racket, which I've never used, uh, Clojure. Um, all these languages, though, they're not on by default. You have to actually use some kind of keyword or structure to actually enable it as we shown here with the local keyword. Right. So here's another example on C++. This is a, the lexical typical scoping that you'll see. And um, so let's take a look. So um, let's look at face count, for example. So this is the beginning of the, of the method. It's called generate triangle mess. This is actual code in the, in the Godot, by the way. This is actual engine code. So I'm giving you a real world example. Um, this is the face count, and it's declared here. And if when this method ends, um, since this is not like allocated on the heap or anything, this is just what's called a stack variable. Uh, it goes out of scope, and it's it's reclaimed. So even if you did something on the heap here, though, it would still go out of scope when this method ends. So um, it's only available in this generate triangle mesh method. It can't be accessed by the object in any way outside of this function. So even though this is like part of the mesh object. It can't access this 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 variable, other than inside this method where it's actually declared. So um, once it's completed, it's no longer usable. Um, every call to this function will create a new face count. So if you had threads or something, and this was running over and over, you would have a different version of this for each uh, invocation of this. So they're all pretty independent, is what that means. Um, so it's not reused, no states leaked in subsequent calls, as I said. Um, now, one exception to that is if you made this static, and we can talk about it another time. Static is a whole different thing. I also recommend against static if you can avoid it, because of that type of thing that's very confusing. That means with a subsequent calls in C++ would uh, have the state from the previous invocation, which gets confusing. Um, so face count is allocated in the stack. That's kind of what I talked about earlier. It's not that, uh, not on the heap, so each time this function is called, uh, it actually pushes this on the stack along with the return uh, um, return pointer for this function where it got called originally. So uh, every time this goes, this function goes out of scope, it reclaims that part of the stack, and it goes back to that return pointer, and so on. And that's kind of how stacks work. And I can show another example of that in a later time. It's a little bit out of the scope of this, though. So, all right, so here's a question. Where is this variable i in scope? So i is, looks like it's declared here, right? So where do you think it would go out of scope? And you can kind of pause the video and then think about that. And so, okay, so if I tried using uh, i here, do you think it would work? And no, of course not. So it, it's only available in this this loop because it's declared in this loop. So, and you'll see stuff like this a lot in for loops. There'll be variables that are declared right in the loop. And if I declared something here in the loop itself too, each invocation will get a new version of that variable if I just declared it right there. All right, let's take a little look at um, global scope examples. So this is for GDScript. Um, what global scope means is that you can access it anywhere. Um, in any object, basically. So in the GD script, we have an option of having a singleton. Uh, it's specified here in the project settings, so it's it's pretty uh, UI configurable. 
it's not really through code that you establish the singleton pattern. And um, what it means is that main only has, in this case, one object ever. It's a singleton. So if you want any other kind of variants of this type of thing, you'd have to load another one, maybe with a different script, a different scene, I guess. Um, so like in this example, chat room is over here, and it has access to the main instance, the main singleton instance, which there will only be one object created. Um, and you can do this in any other uh, object as well. And so you can see here, it can easily call print state without a problem, which does nothing, but it's just for example. So if something is global, it's always in scope. So we can move on to a live example here in GDScript. All right, guys, so I have this uh, instance of uh, Godot 3.1.2, the stable version running here. You can download this um, off the website. And I have a, uh, a demo that I'm working on here. I'm, uh, I'm doing like a multiplayer uh, thing. Though. Hopefully I'll have it together here pretty soon. There's a lot of steps. So, um, and what I have this do, this is actually a client that's connecting to a server that's also defined in this code base. And I'll, I'll link on the description. Um, but don't focus too much on all the, the network parts of it. But th what it's doing is it's grabbing uh, packets from the service that's actually uh, running on one of those Oracle instances. And it's grabbing packets and just printing out the details. No nothing too much. And sending acts back to the server. Anyway, so as you know, process runs every like frame, I guess you'd say. And so you can see here, there is this packet count defined here. And it's getting uh, from this this network abstractions asking how many packets are available. And so that's only defined in this scope. So you shouldn't be able to see that outside here or anything like that, only in this one function. Additionally, we have this other case, like I was talking about, where another scope, see it's hierarchical, right? So there's this packet defined in this loop and it's each time the loop runs, it creates a, a new variable called packet. It gets it from the network abstraction and saves it here, right? So you should be able to see packet from outside the loop, and you should also be able to see the packet count from within the loop. So if I wanted to like print packet count, I should be able to do that, right? So um, one more parenthesis there. Um, so we can see that that works, right? That should work. Um, so if I actually run this, and the server is running. I have it running all the time in a Docker instance anyway. Um, so it gets to this point right here, and we can see that uh, packet count is null right now because this this line hasn't executed. Let's execute it. And now we see it's negative one. So there's no packets at the moment. Uh, I believe that's what that means. And we'll just return, and eventually we're going to get something, I'm sure. Probably when it sends something out to get an act back. Let's see here. Okay, hold on one second here. Maybe I'll put a line here instead. <laughs> it takes a while for the, the communication to work. Okay, so here we go. We have one packet count from the server because it only sends one every once in a while, right? Um, I didn't want it to go crazy for the demo. Um, so we can see packet counts defined here in our list of locals. But you can see that the packet itself is not, because we have not gotten it yet, and it is not in the scope. So there you go. Um, let's go down there. I'll just go down here and from one loop invocation, and we'll grab a packet. OK, so here it is. So that's a packet here, and it's this big json -y object here uh, that gets uh, deserialized. Um, and we can print out the packet count, and so you'll see in the output. One and so we already printed that out before, but just to show you the scope works from this inner scope as well because um, it's hierarchical. So all the scope, all the variables here are available within this scope, but the variables within this scope of this loop are not very available here, right? And similarly, outside the scope, we have a couple things available here, like IP address, and that's available anywhere in this file, right? Anywhere in this class. Um, so anyway, that, that's that's the basics of scope. I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple um, once you understand it. And uh, you might get confused about access modifiers like private and public and things like that that are available in other languages. But for GDScript, it's it's pretty simple. 
And so let's kind of show an example in C++. All right, so I opened up Visual Studio Code to show you uh, some examples in C++. Uh, this is the Godot source code base, and uh, I really like Visual Studio Code for this. If, if you're looking for a solution for editing the engine code, this is a great one. Um, I would use C Lion because um, it's a pretty good one too, but it doesn't support SCONs, the build system that Godot uses, so we'll use this. So I just edited this file a, a little bit ago to make a PR. Uh, that's a pull request, so you just when you want to make changes to Godot, that's what you do for in GitHub. Um, and we can kind of just walk through some of the code and kind of see how it works. Uh, this might take a while to, to run, so I'm not going to bore you guys with that. So I'll start it, and I will just stop the video for a moment. Okay, so it finished building, and it launched it. <laughs> Luckily, <laughs> it can take a little while uh, when you're writing C++. That, you really start to enjoy the high-level languages like uh, GDScript when you have to wait so long uh, to compile. Um, especially if you make a change to a header file that's referenced by a bunch of different files, it will take forever. So, okay, um, I'm opening it up and give me a second here. Okay, so here's the custom build and here's a test script that I wrote to test those new functions that I just put in there. And we can kind of see what happens when I run and there's a breakpoint. So for the, the last one, this line here, you should see the engine have a breakpoint in this spot here. So let's give it a go and hopefully that's what happens. So we'll run the scene. And I'm ready, it should call that. And I believe it did. Let's take a look at what's Okay, so the problem was uh, every time you launch a new project, it actually spawns a new process. So you actually have to attach to that process. And then additionally, when you run from the editor, I didn't actually notice. I thought it was still tied to the subprocess, but uh, you actually have to attach to this process that spawns when you push play uh, manually. Unfortunately, there might be some way to do it in Visual Studio Code automatically, but it's going to be beyond this tutorial because I don't I don't know what it is yet. So right now, it's just I, I changed this to process so it would run all the time so it can catch the debugger a little quicker too. Again, there's probably a better way to do this. You can probably make it stop right when you start this thing and maybe look for a special process name or something in this debugger for Visual Studio Code. Anyway, it's running all the time. Let's go back here. I still got the breakpoint here. Now I can attach to that process. This is a little bit of a guessing game, though, because they look the same. So one of these is the editor. I believe it's the 1700, unintuitively. I would have thought it would be a higher process. That's the process number, I believe, in Windows. But the actual thing that we spawn, the game that's supposed to be running, that's this lower one. I just found that out. So I will attach to that. This takes a few seconds. And we should see in a minute. And I'll just pause the video. Okay, finally uh, started. And so it stopped on the breakpoint. And we know it, it it's in the process now function, so it handles it every frame so we knew it was going to call it eventually so let's take a look at all the variables that we have here so in the locals and I'm getting we're getting used to this this editor so bear with me here um, we have all these nodes and things let's see here global transform so local point that's this guy and that's really nice you can actually like hover over and it shows you the values and stuff this is kind of cool Kind of see how this editor works, uh, the IDE rather. Um, so right here we see that local point is defined and we have this global matrix that actually hasn't been set yet on that breakpoint. Um, but the when C++ uh, executes, it sees all the things that are going to be um, defined typically. I think it pre-processes it. Um, in multiple passes, I guess, and it finds that there's a variable and that function actually uh, allocates it on the first uh, first time the function uh, gets entered. So up here, the variables will be uh, in memory, but they won't be in scope yet. Uh, that's why you can see that here, even though it hasn't actually executed the statement to actually create it yet. Uh, so right, so and you can see that this is in scope, but something like this, screen point is not. You don't see screen point here. And all these other things here that are shown are actually uh, part of 
the class itself and we'd have to go to the header file to show you that um, so like let's just take a look at first draw so give me a second I'll pull that up okay so it didn't look like it was in the header file so let's take a look it might be like some parent class this inherits from or something let's take a look where it is okay so oh I just it, it wasn't it was in the canvas item uh, class okay so anyway um so this is the header file that defines that class and you can see here oh man there's a lot of classes in that one file that's a bit confusing that style but anyway that's what they do on the Godot engine um so canvas item here um has a bunch of stuff uh that it uses right these are all class variables and these are all going to be accessible within that function we were looking at which as you can see here is the case so when I go back here, um, obviously these are all accessible in scope for that instance of this object, this class. Um, yeah, so if I were to define something like this, and I do, uh, local to global transfer matrix, it's not available anywhere else. So if I had uh, another guy here, and I ran, let's see here. Bear, again, bear with me, I'm new to this. Ah, here we go. And you can see that that local to global matrix is no longer defined. And if you look through all these locals and stuff, you don't find it anywhere. Uh, but there's this new one called global to local matrix that is defined in just this function. So that's just a simple case C++. I didn't want to get too in depth. But with a real world example of engine code for Godot. And yeah, and so maybe you learn a little something from this and how to attach to using Visual Studio Code. Um, there's probably more elegant uh, editors out there that will actually auto-attach to anything forked. Um, and I, this one probably will too. I just don't know how to do that yet. But anyway, that's that's all I got. So hopefully, that, uh, hopefully you learned something about scope. It's a pretty easy concept once you get used to it. And just let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.